We mustn't judge too harshly, Will. It was his first time. Have you never felt a sudden rush of panic? <laughs> Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and munching on faces. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at Red Dragon. This adaptation of Thomas Harris's novel takes on the same story as Manhunter, but this time it functions as a prequel to Silence of the Lambs and Hannibal. The film follows FBI agent Will Graham as he tracks down a serial killer known as the Tooth Fairy, who is brutally killing entire families. He enlists the help of Hannibal Lecter, whom he nearly died capturing, to assist him in his hunt. While Hannibal was not a critical success, it still made a ton of money, and the De Laurentiis still wanted to cash in on Lecter's popularity while they could. They ultimately decided to adapt Red Dragon, the first of Thomas Harris's novels featuring Hannibal. This was a pretty controversial decision, as it was already brought to the screen once with Manhunter, and it was pretty well regarded. Red Dragon was directed by Brett Ratner, who has brought us films like Tower Heist, X-Men 3, and the Rush Hour trilogy. This is Ratner's only real foray into horror, and it's arguably his best work as a director. Perhaps the biggest saving grace for Red Dragon was the return of Ted Talley, who had written the screenplay for Silence of the Lambs. He was hesitant to return to the franchise, but he wanted Hannibal's time on screen to end with a bang, rather than with a bunch of crappy sequels. Actors were also hesitant to join the project because of Hannibal's mixed reception, but Tally's return helped to snag a few big players. The cast is a solid group, including Edward Norton from Fight Club and Birdman as Will Graham, Ralph Fiennes from Schindler's List and the Grand Budapest Hotel as Francis Dollarhide, Harvey Keitel from Bugsy and the Irishman as Jack Crawford, Emily Watson from Breaking the Waves and Chernobyl as Reba McClain, and Philip Seymour Hoffman from Capote and The Master as Freddie Lowndes. Cinematography was handled by Dante Spinotti, who was also the cinematographer for Manhunter. The score was composed by Danny Elfman, who has worked on Goodwill Hunting, Spider-Man, and A Nightmare Before Christmas. He was also the lead singer for Oingo Boingo. Red Dragon had a final budget of around 78 million, the second highest in the whole franchise, but the money was still worth it with them making 200 million at the box office. This was lower than Silence and Hannibal by quite a bit, but Red Dragon was still the 20th highest grossing film of the year. It was met with pretty positive reviews, with critics noting the strong acting, writing, and cinematography. It currently has a 68 and 74% on Rotten Tomatoes, putting it right in the middle as far as Hannibal films go. I've never seen Red Dragon before, so I'm interested to see a second take on this familiar story. I hope y'all like sweetbreads, cause we're watching Red Dragon. The movie opens in 1980 at the Baltimore Philharmonic Orchestra where, as explained in the previous film, Benjamin Raspail's crappy flute skills are catching the attention of his peers and Dr. Hannibal Lecter in the crowd. Lecter eyes the flautist, and some time later he has the orchestra's board of trustees over for a fancy dinner. They're sad to say Raspel has gone missing, but are also somewhat relieved they don't have to fire him now. Rich Lady Number 2 asks what this decadent meat is, but he doesn't clue them in that it is Benjamin. Hannibal is cleaning up when he is visited by Special Agent Will Graham, who has been seeking the doctor's counsel on a serial killer case. Graham explains that their profile on the killer is all wrong, as he hasn't been collecting body parts from victims as souvenirs, he's been taking them as meals. The killer has taken a liver, kidney, tongue, thymus, and various muscles that all correlate to cooking. Graham hasn't alerted the FBI yet, and shares that he's starting to get into the headspace of this killer. Lecter describes Will as an eye detector, somebody who can enter the emotional point of view of others, even those who terrify him. Graham wonders how this cannibalistic possibility never crossed Lecter's mind, but he chalks it up to an honest mistake. He advises Will to get some rest and that they will get to work in the morning, and Graham looks over Lecter's tchotchkes while he grabs his coat. He opens up a gastronomy book to find a bookmarked page about sweetbreads, and as Will realizes the truth, Lecter stabs him in the gut. He tells Graham he will soon slip into shock and to avoid resisting, and that he respects him and is sorry it came to this. 
As Lecter announces he will eat Will's heart, the agent finds the strength to stab Lecter with his antique arrows. This isn't quite enough to finish Hannibal, but a couple of shots from Graham take him down. The opening credits take us through the following years via Francis Dollarhide's journal, which features newspaper clippings about Graham's extensive wounds, Lecter's unveiling as the Chesapeake Ripper, his renaming as Hannibal the Cannibal, and the infamous trial that is supposed to lock him up for the rest of his days. The journal also hints at Dollarhide's own psyche, which is fueled by familial trauma, issues with his reflection and identity, and a love for William Blake. Now we hop to the Graham home in Florida, where Will is visited by his old supervisor Jack Crawford. Jack is hoping for help with the Tooth Fairy case, which involves two families killed very similarly in Birmingham and Atlanta. Jack shares that the killer smashes mirrors and places the shards within the victim's eyes. He has trouble with locks, wears latex gloves during his crimes, but doesn't mind leaving his semen behind. Will says they don't need his help catching this guy, but Jack says nobody can analyze cases quite like he can. Jack shares photos of the Jacoby and Leeds families, adding that they were killed during the past two full moons. They have three weeks before the next full moon, and Jack asks him to simply visit the crime scenes and give some insight. Molly is not happy to see her husband leaving and worries for his safety, but Will promises her he won't be anywhere close to danger this time. Graham heads to the Leeds house and immediately notices a dog bed, although there isn't one mentioned in the case file. He heads through the Happy Family home into the blood-soaked bedroom, and he recounts the vicious actions that took place. The killer entered and slashed the father's throat, shot the mother in the stomach, shot both of the children while in their beds, smashed a mirror, dragged the dead children into the master bedroom, and finished off Mrs. Leeds before raping her corpse. He also put the mirror shards in all of their eyes post-mortem, and the reason why is Graham's missing puzzle piece. He's looking over the gnarly crime scene photos at a hotel when he has an epiphany, realizing the mirror shards make the bodies look alive, and that the killer wanted an audience. He lined up the father and children to watch as he defiled Mrs. Leeds, and he remembers that traces of talcum powder were found on her thigh. This indicates that he removed his gloves to touch her and wiped the prints away, but he wonders if he opened her eyes with his bare hands as well. He calls Jack and asks to have Mrs. Leeds' eyelids and eyeballs checked for prints. The police also have a replica of the Tooth Fairy's unique teeth thanks to bite marks he left on Mrs. Leeds. Graham provides his evaluation of the killer to the Atlanta PD, sharing that the mothers were the primary victims, these murders were well planned out, and he will not stop until he is caught. Their key to success is finding the connection between the Leeds and the Jacobis, as right now there seemingly isn't one. The police chief informs Will that the Leeds family brought their dog to the vet the afternoon before their murders, as the pup received a puncture wound and had to be put down. The dog didn't wear a collar tying him to the Leeds family, and the Jacobis had a pet cat that also wasn't found in the home. Will has the Birmingham PD check the backyard for a cat grave, and Jack learns they found a partial thumbprint on Mrs. Leeds' left eye. Will is pounced on by sleazy reporter Freddie Lowndes, who is hoping to learn more about the Tooth Fairy. Graham politely tells him to fuck off, and reminds Crawford that Lowndes snuck into the hospital and documented his Lecter wounds after he was attacked. Jack commends him on the great work so far, but Will says he has done what he promised and has to back out of the case now. Jack reminds him of the various killers he's helped identified, but Will argues he had help with the most difficult cases, usually from Lecter. Graham finally realizes that Jack has been hoping he would visit Lecter to get his insight, but he understands if he can't handle it. Will doesn't know how to say no to anybody and heads to Baltimore, and we get to see shithead Chilton. It's worth noting he treats Will with the utmost respect and also wants to learn any bit of info Graham is willing to share. Will heads down the iconic hallway to Hannibal's cell, and the killer immediately recognizes him from his aftershave. The two make some small talk before Hannibal asks how he caught him, and disagrees when Will says he just got lucky. Lecter knows Will is here to ask about the Tooth Fairy, and Graham says he could make it worth his while if he helps. 
Lecter doesn't believe Chilton would allow him to receive many benefits, and Will says the real prize would be proving he is smarter than the Tooth Fairy. Lecter asks Will if he is smarter than him because he caught him, but Will assures him it wasn't his intelligence that gave him away. You had disadvantages. What disadvantages? You're insane. After some more banter from Hannibal, Graham starts to leave, and Lecter finally agrees to look over the case file. Will gives him an hour to look over it, and he quickly surmises the killer is ugly or disfigured due to the mirror smashing, although he knows Graham has already considered that. He also says the women weren't nearly as valuable to him dead as they were when they were alive, so they must figure out how they caught his eye. He asks what kind of privacy the backyards offered, assuming he watched the victims before he attacked. Lecter is saddened when Will says he might not be able to visit again, and returns to the subject of how he caught him. He tells Will that despite his fear of him, he managed to get into his headspace, and soon he'll do the same to the Tooth Fairy. The reason he's able to do this is because he isn't so different from these killers, it's his dark imagination that connects them. Freddie Lowndes documents Will leaving the prison, and Crawford wonders what Lecter meant about the women catching the killer's eye. He makes another pass through the Leeds house and comes across some home movies, and he watches one that introduces the entire family and shows off how happy they were. Will makes his way to the Jacoby house in Birmingham, and he asks the locksmith why the killer wouldn't enter from the much more hidden first floor entrance. He points out that door had deadbolts, and Will scopes out the backyard for Tooth Fairy sign. He finds the tree the Tooth Fairy posted up in the Watch the Jacoby family, predicting he watched them bury the cat he killed and waited until nightfall to descend. He notices a symbol carved into the tree, telling Will he is very proud of his handiwork. Aw shit, it's time to meet the man himself, at the former Dollar Hyde nursing home where a voiceover flashback details Francis's abusive grandmother. He reflects on her threats to castrate him as he pumps iron, and we see his unique bite mark comes from an upper denture he wears due to palate surgery. He unveils his impressive journal, and it's made the news that Graham visited Lecter in relation to his murders. Francis does not like Freddy or his Tooth Fairy nickname, but he does seem to like Hannibal. Will reconvenes with Lecter and updates him on the carved symbol, and that the killer brought bolt cutters to clear branches in the tree. Will doesn't believe that was the sole reason he brought the bolt cutters though, and he explains that the symbol comes from Mahjong and represents the red dragon piece. Lecter of course already knew that, and he asks Will to get to the point. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. He believes the killer brought the cutters to enter the home, but for some reason he cut through the second floor glass door instead. This woke the Jacobis, and the killer had to shoot the husband as he came down the staircase. Lecter points out this was the Tooth Fairy's first time, so he's probably a bit jumpy and unorganized. They agree he is much more strategic now, and Lecter says he is evolving. Barney and the boys escort Hannibal back to his cell, where he has scheduled 10 minutes to talk with his lawyer. He immediately hangs up on him though, and starts fiddling with the phone. He manages to call the University of Chicago's Department of Psychology, and he convinces a temp to go through a professor's Rolodex and give him Graham's P.O. Box in Florida. Will heads to the library to research Lecter's quote about Robbins, and learns it comes from a poet and artist named William Blake. He looks over Blake's work and is drawn toward a painting which is titled The Great Red Dragon and the Woman Clothed with the Sun. The image is from a series that illustrates the writings of Revelation 12, which essentially depicts Satan's war against heaven. We hop over to Chromalux Print Lab where Francis works as the head of technical services, and he meets with a film technician named Reba McLean. She's developed some infrared film for him as a zoo is documenting their nocturnal animals. Reba is blind, which is somewhat comforting for Dollar Hyde, and he watches her deal with an unwanted pass from a co-worker named Ralph. Reba despises the fake pity she gets from most people, but Francis ensures her that he feels no pity for her. He watches her as she waits for the bus, and he convinces her to let him drive her home. She invites him inside for a drink, which he awkwardly agrees to, and she shares her love of animals. 
One of her few memories before she lost her sight was seeing a cougar at the zoo, although she truly doesn't remember what it looked like. She questions why he is so quiet, and she explains that she can hear he has had reconstructive oral surgery. She says he speaks very clearly and hopes he will speak to her more, because she understands how it feels to be different. Reba tries to touch his face but is stopped, although he promises she hasn't offended him. Will calls to request a look through the Jacoby's personal items to get a better feel for them, and Crawford tells him they found a note from the Tooth Fairy in Lecter's cell. They worry Lecter will catch on if he's held for too long, and Crawford has Chilton cut the power as a diversion. Will rushes to Baltimore as Jack updates the crew, and as the forensics team captures any DNA they can, we read over the note. The Tooth Fairy doesn't believe Lecter will give away his identity, but also notes the body he currently resides in is trivial, only a host to what he is becoming. He has collected every article ever written about Hannibal and finds his reviews as poor as the one he receives now. The building operator pretends to be pissed about the outage, and Lecter has gotten rid of a portion of the note, presumably directions on how to reply. Bowman is able to find pieces of letters that were covered up with marker, but the ink below is still visible. They quickly realize Lecter is meant to respond through the National Tattler's personal ad section. The Tooth Fairy has also taken interest in Graham and worries he will meddle too far. They put the note back into its hiding place, although Lecter picks up on this janitor's poorly hidden gloves. They identify an ad likely to be Hannibal's, and it is very complimentary and vague. It lists a bunch of Bible verses which are obviously code, but they don't have time to solve it before the tattler is released. They decide to let the ad run, hoping it doesn't incite the Tooth Fairy into doing something unexpected. Bowman uses a record of Lecter's books to see which could match the code, and within a cookbook he discovers that he gave the Tooth Fairy the county Will's family lives in. He tells him to kill the entire family, and Jack immediately tells Will. Molly and Josh wake to a helicopter outside as a SWAT team rolls in, and they are flown to a remote safe house to stay until the killer is caught. Molly is choking back the words I told you so, but she is supportive of Will seeing this case through now. She practices her marksmanship, and Chilton gleefully takes all of Hannibal's mail, drawings, and other personal items. Freddie Lowndes was caught impersonating an FBI agent trying to get access to autopsy photos, and Jack thinks he could be useful to them. They give Lowndes a bullshit story to put in the tattler, hoping to anger the Tooth Fairy and draw him out. They call him ugly, impotent with women, maybe gay, and incestuous. They add that Lecter is disgusted with his amateur killings, and that Will spends many late nights in this secluded DC office, so it would be a great place to kill him. <laughs> They plan to line the neighboring buildings with snipers and SWAT teams, and that night Francis picks up the derogatory headline. Once again, the boys didn't think about the other name in that headline with Will, and Dollar Hyde attacks Freddy in the Tattler's parking lot. He wakes up in the Dollar Hyde mansion, super glued to an antique wheelchair, and he immediately starts offering cash for his safe release. He claims not to know who's responsible for this, but Francis makes it clear he is the so-called Tooth Fairy. Lowndes feigns interest in his ideology, claiming he could properly inform his readers, and Francis tells him he is no longer a man. He becomes something new with every person he transforms, and he wants to show Lowndes. He forces Freddy to open his eyes and unveils his giant tattoo, and flexes and contorts to make the dragon move. He shows Lowndes a picture of William Blake's painting of the Great Red Dragon, along with images of Mrs. Leeds and Jacoby before, during, and after he changed them. Freddy says it was Graham that told him to write lies, and he promises to only write the truth from now on. Francis says he is privy to a great becoming, yet recognizes nothing, and a creature as insignificant as him can only tremble in the presence of the dragon. He whips out a script and a tape recorder, and has Lowndes record a message we'll hear in a little bit. Freddy asks if he can go now, but Francis instead bestows him with a very toothy kiss. He does return Freddy to the tattler, just a little warmer than how he left. The gents listen to the recording in which Lowndes speaks to the wondrous power of the Great Red Dragon. 
He says the dragon is aware Will made him lie, and his punishment will be far worse than Freddy's. They determine the killer probably has a van, has access to antique wheelchairs, and he must live within six hours of Chicago. They begin researching these points and decide to contact the Tattler to learn where it was released early, hoping a vendor will remember a strange customer. Will doesn't believe Chicago will hold any answers for them, as this was just a side mission in his larger quest. He wants to reconvene with Lecter and discuss the case, hoping he can sway some information out of Hannibal. He congratulates Will on killing Lowndes and asks him if he enjoyed the first time he killed someone. He imagines so, as even God enjoys a good murder. He believes Molly and Josh will be safe now, as killing Lowndes was essentially the same as killing Will's pet before coming for him directly. He also argues that his family will never be safe though, as Will has a natural attraction to danger. He knows they found the note, and Will asks Hannibal to give him any information he's willing to. He offers to restore his privileges and even provide new ones like computer access, and Lecter decides to give him a small sample. He tells Will he has looked at the Blake painting but hasn't truly seen it, and the transformation of ugliness to power it represents to the killer. Will wants to know how the killer chooses his victims, but Lecter has demands of his own that must be met first. Meanwhile, Francis is taking Reba on a mystery date, and by golly, he took her to the zoo to pet an unconscious tiger. She pets the big soft boy and listens to his heartbeat, and Francis invites her over for dinner that night. Reba is impressed with his giant house and fancy taste in music, and she admits lots of women at their work find him mysterious. They've told her he is sensitive about his face but shouldn't be, and that he has a rock-solid body. She grabs a hold of Francis and gives him a kiss, and it's very unfortunate she can't see his bathroom. He has to watch a tape for work, but invites her to stay while he does, and it is the home video of his next victims. Reba is ready to rumble though, so Francis gets a blowjob while he watches this poor lady in her swimming pool. Francis wakes after a night of lovemaking to find Reba missing, and he frantically searches the house for her. His grandmother's image seemingly yells at him as he ensures his manifesto hasn't been tampered with. He tells the dragon he cannot have Reba, and as he watches her putts around the yard, he begs the dragon to let her stay in his life for just a little bit longer. He whips out a shotgun and tells the dragon she is nice, and he nearly blows his own brains out before falling to his knees. He recalls the painting is housed in the Brooklyn Museum, and he quickly tells Reba he is going away and tells her to beat it. Will receives the belongings of the Jacoby family, and he notices they too have a home movie. Will compulsively rewatches the tape, trying to figure out what Lecter meant about seeing instead of looking. Lecter enjoys his fancy-ass dinner, and Will notices a padlock on the basement door, which he believes is why the Tooth Fairy brought bolt cutters. But the Jacobis had a new door with deadbolts installed a couple of months before their murders, meaning the killer must have cased the house even earlier than that. He was also prepared with a glass cutter for the Leeds house, although that glass door wasn't visible from the street or even the yard. They realize he knew the house is inside and out. Meanwhile, Francis has traveled to the Brooklyn Museum to see the Blake painting in person, and we learn that under a pseudonym, he's been writing a dissertation about it. He knocks out the poor employee and begins eating the damn painting, and I must admit he's downing that sucker. Another employee enters and gets attacked by Francis, and Crawford looks into if the Jacobis had any sort of services done that would require a stranger to enter the home. Will realizes neither family pets had collars, but the killer still knew they belonged to the victims. He suddenly realizes every detail he came prepared for was on this home movie, and he has the Bureau check the Jacobi belongings for home videos as well. Sure enough they do, and it was also produced at Chromalux in St. Louis. The boys get word of the museum incident, and Will suspects the killer is trying to stop himself. Francis is preparing his getaway when he notices some people at Chromalux, and by golly, it's Will Graham. Time to go, Francis! The Chromalux manager is reluctant to give up his employees' files, but once Will describes their suspect, they immediately think of Dollarhide. 
He fits the description, and as the manager of technical services, he has access to every tape that comes through Chromalux. Reba has received a ride home from Ralph, who wisely suggests she avoid the very moody Francis. That kiss on the cheek was a death sentence right there, Ralphie boy. Francis quickly knocks out Reba and brings her back to his place, and he tells her to be quiet before the dragon hears her. He tried to kill him but wasn't able to, and now he wants her like all the others. The cops are heading to Dollar Hides, where he is currently dumping cans of gas and yelling at the dragon. Reba begs Francis not to give her to him, asking to come with him instead. Unfortunately, the only place Francis plans to go is down the barrel of his shotgun, and he sets the house ablaze. He tells Reba he won't let the dragon bite her to death, and he will shoot her and then himself. He can't bring himself to hurt Reba though, and Dollarhide shoots himself off screen. Reba confirms the messy kill and starts her memorized exit from the house, which the agents have finally arrived at. They pull up on the traumatized Reba, who tells them Francis shot himself, and the mansion literally explodes. Will wraps up his interview with Reba, ensuring her that she was the one good thing Francis had to hang on to. Dollarhide's manifesto survived the fire, and Will tells Molly that he felt very sorry for Francis and the years of abuse he went through. But Crawford gets a call informing him the bones they found were not Dollarhide, they were his co-worker Ralph. Will heads inside to find out what's taking Josh so long to get the s'more stuff, and that's when he finds a smashed up mirror. He overhears Crawford as he leaves a voicemail, and he heads upstairs to find Dollarhide holding Josh hostage. He has Will drop his knife as he explains that he will forever change the Graham family, but Will gets an idea when he sees Josh as peed his pants. He begins impersonating Grandma Dollarhide, embarrassing and threatening Josh for the mess he has made. This angers Dollarhide enough to release the boy and attack, and the two trade a couple of knife wounds. Will and Josh run to the master bedroom, and Will whips out a cached handgun as Dollarhide busts down the door. Francis disappears as Molly enters the house though, and Will tells her to drop as both men unload their guns at each other. Both of them take quite a few bullets, but it is Molly who lands the killing blow to Francis' dome. She and Josh cry as we hear sirens in the distance, but a letter from Hannibal lets us know Will survived his wounds. He reminds Will to remember who gave him his greatest scar and tells him he thinks of him often. Will tosses the letter into the ocean as he is finally ready to leave this dangerous life behind and focus on his family. But there will always be agents hoping to work with the famous Lecter. In fact, there is a beautiful young agent hoping to meet him at this very moment. What is her name? And that's Red Dragon. All in all, I think it's a strong outing for the Lecter franchise. This one is interesting because it's the one film in the franchise that demand it be compared to all the other movies that came before it. Red Dragon did receive critique for feeling pretty safe, the most like a popular horror movie made for mass appeal. I don't really disagree with that point, it doesn't have the same amounts of scary or truly jarring moments as its predecessors, but I think that makes sense as this movie has the most people to please. First there are fans of the book, then there are fans of Manhunter, and then there are fans of the first two movies in this trilogy. And as you can imagine, these groups probably had pretty different expectations. So while it all feels a bit familiar, I think Red Dragon does a good job of pulling from all of these different influences and blending them together. The entire cast gives solid performances and they help to replicate and deviate from the expectations of their characters. It's hard to discuss characters without looking at their Manhunter versions as well, but generally speaking I think the characters and their relationships with one another are stronger in Red Dragon. We spend way more time with Francis and Reba this time around, which helps their relationship feel more natural and even sweet at times. Ralph Fiennes brings some stellar range to Dollarhide, and the script takes the time to flesh out his mental illness and ideology as the Great Red Dragon. Dollarhide is easier to understand this time, and while that makes him a little less scary, it makes him way more compelling. A lot of this extra time with Francis and Lecter takes away from the time with Will's family, but I personally prefer learning more about the villains. 
Anthony Hopkins is great as usual, although he feels more like he did in Hannibal than Silence of the Lambs. The opening scene where Will takes down Lecter is one of the more debated additions of this movie, but I personally think it adds a strong foundation for the two for the rest of the movie. Edward Norton gives Will Graham a very different feel than William Peterson did, and it's their two performances that really define their two movies. Graham in Manhunter feels unhinged and ready to snap, whereas in Red Dragon he feels much more in control. He still has that wicked imagination that helps him understand psychos like Lecter, but he is less of a morally grey character. He still has that wicked imagination that helps him understand psychos like Lecter, but he is less of a morally ambiguous character this time. The whole bait and switch ending somehow really surprised me, and I think it helped connect Francis and Will in ways that Manhunter did not. Generally, Red Dragon feels less cold and disconnected from the violence on screen, and I'm trying to decide which approach I like better. The film also provides a lot more explanation and exposition than Manhunter, which also comes with pros and cons. I'm glad there was more involvement with the William Blake painting and its meaning to Francis, but there were also a lot of times where things that could have just been shown visually were also explained verbally just to ensure the audience was clued in. But overall, Red Dragon is a solid return to form after the messy Hannibal. It is a well-made film from the writing, directing, acting, shooting, and editing. As I said earlier, I think it's one of the stronger films in the franchise, but I'm not sure how it will stack up against Manhunter in my ranking. I really liked both movies, and they both have their strengths and weaknesses. It seems pretty clear to me that Thomas Harris's earlier work is his better work, as Hannibal was pretty messy, and from my understanding, Hannibal Rising is going to be the worst of the bunch. Maybe I'm wrong though? We'll find out pretty soon, but first join me in two weeks as I check out a mystery patron request. Thank you all for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Red Dragon. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support this channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks y'all.